into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Jesus' last words were a prayer. And then this summary statement from Luke in chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Well, you say, that must have been easy for Jesus. I mean, he was God, right? I mean, of course he had an amazing prayer life. Let's look at this verse a little closer and see if that mindset is right. It says Jesus often withdrew. Not Christ. See, Christ, uh, the Messiah, another way to refer to Jesus or his favorite name for himself, which was the Son of Man. These all pointed to his divinity. No, the text says Jesus, his human name. In fact, a very common name in Israel 2,000 years ago. Jesus. And when the Bible speaks of this Jesus, it talks about the hypostatic union. Have you heard about that? That's this idea that Jesus was fully human and yet fully divine in one person. Amazing, mind-blowing. We can't really understand it, but it was true that when God came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, he did not lose his divinity, but he took on full humanity. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Fully human fully divine, this second member of the triune God, Father, Son, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, on earth, pulling away to pray often. So here's the question I have for you. Was it Jesus's divinity or his humanity that needed to pull away and pray? What do you think? Anyone? Anyone? Speak up. Humanity. Humanity. Hmm. Might be right. You see, does, does divinity need to pray? No. See, God receives prayers. Human beings need to pray. But why would Jesus need to pray? Wasn't he perfect? Well, he was. But Hebrews 4.15 says that he was tempted. He was tested in every way that we are, yet he was without sin. That's really good news. So how did Jesus battle temptation through prayer to his Father? Now, in this verse of Hebrews 4.16, what was the situation or temptation that demanded prayer? Let's go back one verse to verse 15. It says, But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him and preach and to be healed hear him preach, and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Jesus pulled away for prayer when success threatened to rule his heart. You see, Jesus starting to revel in his success was actually a danger to his mission. And he knew that. And he would pull away to be with his father when things started going too good. But Jesus didn't just pull away when things were going well. He pulled away when things were difficult. You know, when he was hurting or he, when he was challenged, his cousin John was killed, was murdered, beheaded by Herod. And here's what Matthew records, chapter 14. As soon as Jesus heard the news about John, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. Jesus also pulled away for prayer when he had a big decision to make. Luke 6. One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. I just read that a minute earlier. And it says this, At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Hmm. Now, this is not how human beings typically respond to these common life moments. I mean, if we were Jesus, it might be more like this. When the vast crowds came, we found a larger venue for them to be in. Or when our cousin was killed, we sought revenge. Or when we had to pick our friends, we considered who had 
the most Instagram followers or who would make us more popular. No, his response, his behaviors were very different. In fact, they were otherworldly. Wow, things are going so great in my life. I'm going to get away to be alone with the Father. My goodness, this hurts. I'm in so much pain right now. I'm going to get away to be alone with the Father. I've got a huge decision to make. What am I going to do? I'm going to get away to be alone with the Father. And it says in Luke 5, 16 that Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. It says he went often. Now, I just told you a story from 2013, and I told it because it was a dramatic example of the impact that silence and solitude can have. But if that was the last time that I went into extended silence and solitude, that would not be following Jesus. Because he went often. And he went to the wilderness. See, other translations say the desert or deserted places or remote places or lonely places or some place where he could be alone. Jesus often, maybe daily, withdrew to the wilderness to quiet, alone places for prayer. And there is power in praying in a secluded place to God. Have you been in those places where you don't have to hold anything back? I went through a very difficult season in ministry when nothing was going right. And I had a very close friend, a pastor, and I sat with him and I said, I think I should quit. It's not going well. And he kept asking me the same question, did God call you? And I said, I believe he did. He said, he's got purpose in this moment, Dave. You need to figure it out. And every week I would sit with him and I'd have the same story. I was just struggling. And he finally just laid it out. And he said, you need to get away. You need to find somewhere to go and just be before God. Almost like stop coming to me. (laughs) Start going to him. And I did. Every Friday, I just took half the day. And I went to a local retreat center. And they gave me a building where I was all alone. And I would just pour my heart out. These weren't, you know, churchy prayers like I'm doing now. These were raw, honest emotion before God. What are we going to do? My family is suffering because of this ministry. I'm suffering. What are you going to do? Pouring myself out, opening the Bible, asking God for answers just before him. After months of this, God did answer dramatically and changed the direction of everything in my life. Have you been to places like that? Where you can pray out loud? Where you can pour your heart out to God? Have you ever had that kind of relationship with him? Is your relationship just this? Very formal? Or is it me and him alone? Don't you see? That's what Jesus did. The perfect ultimate human being who came to show us the way pulled away to be with his father. And I'm not going to do that. You see, there's no logic that can help us escape the piercing question before you and I this morning. Am I or are we followers of Jesus? And if the answer is, I think I am, well then the next question is, will I follow him into silence and solitude? Comer says in his book, Jesus never commands you to wake up in the morning and have a quiet time. Read your Bible, live in community, practice Sabbath, give your money to the poor, or any of the core practices from his way. He just does these practices and then says, follow me. Now, my guess is 
the decision to take this next step in following Jesus is going to be challenging for most of us. You see, we've become accustomed, or should I even say addicted, to the constant stimulation of the digital age. I guarantee you that even while I've been talking, some of you have been thinking about your phone. And I'm not saying that to try to make you feel bad. I'm saying because I want you to be aware of what's really happening in your heart and in your life. Technology has got a hold of us. It's not good. I mean, think about it. Uh, Today's just the perfect day almost to be preaching this sermon, isn't it? Because the Super Bowl represents sort of all that's great about America and all that's really broken. (laughs) It's this hyped up, ridiculous event with commercials and a halftime show and a very violent game. (laughs) Look, I'm going to watch it, all right? (laughs) I can't not watch it. But it's become so normal. And should it be? for followers of Jesus? I mean, our constant consumption of media, of videos, of music, of news stories, news feeds, of games, of noise, wanting our attention, calling for our attention, social media relentlessly wanting our attention. And we're giving it. Do we need a change? Well, I think if we're going to be followers of Jesus, maybe we do. But change is hard. (laughs) Change is hard. And to break our habit of hurry and distraction, we're going to need to see how dangerous our situation really is. Makes me think of a few years ago, I was driving down I-74 westbound, you know, kind of coming north from Galesburg. 76 miles an hour, I'm in the left lane, and I hit a deer. A deer popped out right in front of uh, the car. I have a couple pictures of it here for you to see. Uh, That was my Toyota Camry. That's deer hair in the door handle of my car. Smashed the whole driver's side of the car, just popped right out. I barely had time to touch my brakes. Now, you might see that and be like, well, I'm glad you were okay, Dave, and boy, what a shame that that happened to you. It was. was And I could see it in the distance. And I just chose to just keep rolling at 76 miles an hour and plow right into that deer. Your reaction to me might be a little different. Now, what went from what a shame might turn into what a fool. Why didn't you slow down? Why didn't you swerve or change direction? Couldn't you see what was in front of you? Were you driving distracted? You'd have a lot of questions for me and probably not a lot of grace. Friends, with all the love in my heart, there is danger in front of us. Do you understand that there's even physical danger in our addiction to noise. Jenny Safran, the study, a developmental psychologist from University of Wisconsin, she said that background noise hurts kids. It hurts their chi- children's ability to recognize familiar words, prevents toddlers from mastering new ones. Kids that grow up with a lot of noise have more trouble learning. The consequences, she says, of the constant urban rumble extend beyond childhood. Numerous studies have linked Noise pollution, listen, to increased anxiety, depression, high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke. Even small increases in unwanted ambient sound have significant effects. Stepping into quiet can actually save our lives. There's physical realities to being in quiet. And there are also mental and emotional and spiritual ones. Here's what Comer says from the book. This new normal of hurried digital distraction is robbing us of the ability to be present. Present to God, present to other people, present to all that is good, beautiful, and true in our world, even present to our own souls. 
The noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we most need. So this distraction is hurting us, and it's hurting the relationships that matter the most in our lives, including our relationship with God. Do you want to save your marriage? Step into silence and solitude. Do you want to have healthy friendships? Step into silence and solitude. I'm pleading with you. Now, we're in church, and we're notorious for thinking often that doing more is the way to getting closer to God. So you're thinking now, uh, maybe I'll just add that, Dave, to my current routine. You know, I mean, I come to church every week, or maybe I'll start coming to church every week, and I'm going to pack in more Bible studies and more sermons, and I'll listen to more podcasts, and I'll, I'll listen to more worship music, and then I'm going to have intimacy with Jesus, what you're talking about. Those are all really good things, and I'd like you to do those things. But this discipline of silence and solitude cannot be forced into 20-minute breaks within your hectic day. You know, you see, we're like river water. Have you ever scooped up in a clear cup uh, a, a cup of water from the Mississippi River and then just drank it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but if you took that water, it would not be clear, would it? It's like a big muddy river. But if you took that water and you set it down and you let it sit for some time, that sediment would begin to settle. And that water would get clear. And that's a good picture of our move towards silence and solitude. You see, the Lord wants to bring clarity and peace. He wants to settle our souls. And that takes time. And more than that, the Holy Spirit wants to ignite fire in our lives. Fire for God love for God, passion for Him, for our relationship with Him. But we have to create space for that fire to burn. Author Judy Brown wrote on this, she says, what makes a fire burn is space between the logs, a breathing space. See, too much of a good thing, too many logs packed in too tight can douse the flames almost as surely as a pail of water would. So building fires requires attention to the spaces in between as much as to the wood. When we're able to build open spaces in the same way we have learned to pile on logs, then we can come to see how it is fuel and absence of the fuel together that make fire possible. We only need to lay a log lightly from time to time. A fire grows simply because the space is there with openings in which the flame that knows just how it wants to burn can find its way. Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine 
so great of mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever in jesus christ my living hope. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Come on. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me, and you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living Just you sing it, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me because of you. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are 
my living hope. Amen, church. Amen. Come on. We want to thank you for all your support to this church. This is not just for the people that work here, but this is for the community. When you guys give your offering, your time, that helps build God's kingdom on this earth. You're not just helping Northridge, you're helping the kingdom of God. We encourage you guys to keep doing what you're doing, because it's awesome, and we love to see it. The ways that you can help us, not just us, like I said, the kingdom of God, we have multiple ways. One is through the website. You can go there and give it there, or you can go behind the curtains. We have little baskets that you can deposit whatever your heart is telling you to do. But again, we're thankful for what you guys do. Your support, your spiritual support is also very important. So remember, money is, yeah, money is awesome. We all love money, right? Yeah, I heard it. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. He was a kid. I mean, I would like it too, but no, for real. But also the spiritual support is very important, church. Uh, we come to church to worship together, but when we go home, it's also important to pray for each other. I do that. My family does that. So let's just keep doing that together, all right? Awesome. I'm going to invite you guys to stand. We're going to sing a song that I know you all know very much, and it's also a way to bless every one of you. We dropped the key from last week so I can hear you guys louder. Because it's also loud, but I want to hear more. So I encourage you guys to just sing it out loud and do this as a prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace repeat that one more time church the lord bless you and keep you make his Turn his face toward you and give you peace. We sing amen because we believe it, church. And amen, amen, amen. amen. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And amen. thousand generations in your family in your children and their children and their children may favor 
in a thousand generations in your family in your children in their children in their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in their children in their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family in your children in their children in their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 is for you says uh, one of the great problems of spirituality in our day and age is that so few people feel safe enough to admit how separated we feel from God. We rarely experience God's presence throughout our day. Love, joy, and peace does not describe the felt experience of many Christians. Often we come to church hoping for a God hit, a fleeting moment of connection to God before we return to the secular wasteland. Could the antidote for this spiritual malaise be as easy as silence and solitude? Well, I talked a lot this morning about the why. Why should we consider a different rhythm in our life with God of stepping into this silence and solitude? And I want to now give you a resource to, of the how to do that. As you walk out, you'll be handed uh, two pages that I copied from a book that I have called The Spiritual Discipline Handbook by Adele Calhoun. And it's a wonderful resource. And this gives us some direction in solitude and in silence. And then you're going to notice on here, there's some bolded text. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, Please schedule two hours this next week to be in silence and solitude with the Lord. I'm actually asking you to consider doing something maybe you've not done. I'm actually asking you to commit this morning, and please don't say yes to this if you're not ready to commit, that you will actually schedule two hours, consecutive hours, this week to pull away. This will be your helpful guide to be with the Lord. Have you ever had two hours away with him? This would be a good start. Are you willing to commit to that Northridge family? Yes or no? Let's do that again. Are you ready, willing to commit to that your Northridge family? Yes or no? It's okay if you're not, but I would encourage you to take a risk. Schedule two hours. You've got my word. I've already scheduled it into my, into my calendar for this coming week. It's there. 
I want us to be true followers of Jesus. Because our desperate, hurting, confused world is counting on us. Let's close our time together in prayer. Jesus, we want to follow you. Give us the courage to move away from distractions and withdraw to quiet, alone spaces this week. And Lord, we ask you to meet us there. Quiet us internally as we take steps to quiet our lives externally. Holy Spirit, set us aflame as we create this space. May passion for Jesus burn brightly in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we know the world is waiting for a word from you, for a calm, steady presence in the midst of the chaos. Make us your ambassadors to a world in need, we pray in your amazing name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Have a wonderful week.